Welcome everyone to another week of the Focus TV. We're joined by Octavia Wyatt, Cardo Dudley Jr., Raymond Lyons. I'm Wilson Turpe, doing season seven, episode 46 of the Focus TV. Before we get started with our normal, you know, our, our regular scheduled uh, items, uh, you know, we just want to start by uh, wanting to extend our prayers and well wishes to the family of Dikembe with someone a very tough time. Uh, you passed yesterday due to a struggle with brain cancer at 58 years old. Uh, we've started far too many shows like this. We've been giving flowers to greats who unfortunately are no longer with us. Like the past couple of years, it's been, it's been a good amount of shows, unfortunately, where we started uh, in this manner. Um, that said, as we always do, want to just go around and uh, so everyone can share a few thoughts on uh, the late Dikembe Mutombo. Uh, Ray, we'll start with you, uh, then Cardell Octavia. Yeah, like you said, man, it just, just feels like this is happening like a lot recently um yeah and like always you know whenever um you know whenever somebody of his stature you know passes away just just want to make sure they're they're remembered and recognized for um for as great as they were uh you know the thing that really stands out to me about uh Dikembe specifically is you know you hear people talk about his exploits on the court and all that stuff which is which is phenomenal but the um the stories about who he was as a person, um, you know, just bring out even more. And uh and that really says something, man, because he definitely accomplished a lot in basketball. Um, but uh but yeah, man, leaving leaving your mark on the world in in a way that you know even exceeds what he did athletically is just um it's just a testament to how he lived his life. Uh but um but basketball wise, I mean, just the ultimate competitor. Um I always like players that are, you know, where their their identity is, is defense. Like that's the first thing you ever want to think about whenever Dikembe is brought up. Um, like how many how many people have been have have a celebration for for defensive plays? You know what I mean? Like that's that's just crazy. Like you know we we got all the 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 Steph shimmy or the three to the dome thing that people do. This, this dude's signature was the finger wag after. You know, blocking your shot, and the the play always rings out for me when he had like three blocks on one play, and just just stopped mid play and just gave him the the no 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 like it's, that's just disheartening, man. But um, but yeah, he definitely a great player, um, even better person. Um, you know, I, I know the basketball community is is real, and um, of course those that know him personally, uh, I saw the message that um that Alonzo Mourning put up, uh. And they their Georgetown ties and um and their friendship it just uh I can just only imagine what he's dealing with but um but yeah man just just want to make sure that you know the Kembe gets his flowers and and yeah it's hopefully we don't have to do another one of these for a very long time but um but yeah man it's just a life we'll live but fifty eight is just way too young. It's on me. Yeah, uh, obviously we lost one of the greatest defensive players. It's not, I don't want, I just don't want to limit it to a position. He's one of the great defensive players in the history of the game. Uh, you know, that goes without saying. I mean, <laughs> four time defensive player of the year, um, eight time all star, three time all NBA, six time NBA all defensive team. Three-time blocks leader, two-time NBA rebounder leader. I mean, you know the the accolades speak for itself. Um, but you know, obviously, being a student of the game and a historian of the game, uh, you you I I knew about a lot of the off the court stuff that he was involved in, specifically building a hospital where he's from, which was motivated by his mom passing away when he was young because she couldn't get the medical attention uh, that she needed. And it was like a curfew going on in his home country. So his pops couldn't take his mom to another hospital in hopes of trying to do anything to save her life. And she passed away and that's what fueled him. And he did it the right way, man. He did it the right way. When you get to a point where you one of the elite players uh, as an athlete or whatever, you want the elite people in your field, it doesn't matter. And you come into you know, you know, great compensation for being elite. Your network grows, 
to where you have ties to some powerful people with resources and whatnot, put that stuff to use to make the world a better place instead of being selfish. And that's exactly what he did. You know, you, um, you know, I, I remember saying in the interview years ago that it wasn't easy getting the hospital built. He thought it would be easy because, you know, he's a good guy. He knows a lot of people in the NBA. Obviously, being a Georgetown alum, we all know about the Georgetown network of alums, and here it reaches far and wide and a lot of the lanes. And he thought it was just a matter of, look, I'm building a hospital to help people. Uh, whatever you can donate, please donate. And a lot of people wasn't cutting those checks at first. So, you know, he had to he had to work a little hard. He said it was a headache, but he finally got it built. And then it saves a lot of lives, man. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that's his greatest legacy. You know, you see a lot of NBA players that make a lot of money. You start to see them build more schools and just have their own curriculum to try to impact the youth. And and when you impact the youth, you impact the world because that's the next wave. That's the next generation. And to me, that's 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 the biggest impact he he made through the game. Um, far bigger than any block he had or any rebound he grabbed. It's the fact that, you know, his legacy would live on uh, through so many, you know, off the court, you know, uh, just ideas and ideals that he instilled from the hospital to nonprofits to uh, partnerships with other people. I know he was a consistent guy, you know, in the NBA cares where, the, you know, former NBA players were just traveling around the world uh, you know, different countries, putting on clinics, talking to the people, just trying to, you know, build the game, you know what I'm saying, but also help people, you know what I mean, through the game. And he, he was always a consistent guy um, in, involved with that. And by all accounts, man, he was just a, a dude that loved life, man. He was hilarious. He was funny. You know, obviously, you know, when he get to talking, it's hilarious and stuff like that, man. You know what I mean? If you ain't used to it, but uh, – always joyful but when he was on that court he was about his business and you know listen that that you know i, I put up a post about that that lineage that that georgetown lineage from pat to to zo to matumbo i know matumbo was there a year early but matumbo zo that would never be duplicated again um you know the only program i could see that would get hall of famers at that in the front court from the same school in that shortest span is all is probably the kentucky Cause you know, like AD, Randall, Carl Towns, and all those guys, you know, playing for them in such a short period of time. But the impact that they made, not just here in DC playing for the Hoyas, but going to the NBA and becoming Hall of Fame players. And the thing that they all had in common is that they, they led with the defense and rebounding. And then they built their game out on offense. You see what I'm saying? Um, the same type of blueprint. Obviously, Patrick was the best out of all of them, but still, they all had the kind of same kind of blueprint. And it, and it worked, you know what I'm saying? And um, they were dominant on the collegiate level and they were dominant in the pros at, at what they did, man. So, yeah, this this one this one was different because he was such a good guy. And the, the work he was doing, and, and 58 is super young. It, it's very young, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know people like to crack jokes on older people and all that, but I just grew up different. I saw a lot of death young. I appreciate getting older. Uh, a lot of people didn't make it. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of families would have loved to see their loved ones get old. You know what I mean? So to me, that's not an uncool thing. That's a very cool thing. Because like I said, a lot of people didn't make it. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I, don't, I don't really play games with that, man. But, you know, some people just going to choose to be ignorant for that one. But, you know, neither here nor there, man. You know, uh, he died young. But the impact he made, you know, it, it – that should help his family kind of deal with it better because that's how you're supposed to live your life. When you, when your time is up, you should want to look up, look back and people look back at your life. You know, like, you know what, man, he, he or she, they made that mark on the world and it was for the better. And as long as you can say that, man, you, everybody should be proud. I'd say me. Yeah. I mean, you guys both just said it as best as I possibly could. I mean, as great of a basketball player he was, and you know, being, you know, a kid watching the game. And I agree with Ray. I've always been a defensive player because I'll be honest, I wasn't the great on the offensive side. So I kind of took pride playing defense. So I always kind of gravitated towards players that played really, really well defense. Um, and like you said, just an overall defensive player. Um, you, you list all his accolades on the court. I mean, I think they said 
He had 3,289 blocks, <laughs> second most in the NBA history. Um, it's it's sad to see, you know, I, I remember when it came across my phone, I was just kind of in disbelief, to be honest, because um, like we've all kind of already know that 58 is pretty young, but um, it's, it's a tough situation, you know, especially for his family. And then, like you said, the type of person that he was off the court, it means that much more, you know, you can see the joy that he had, not in just playing the game, but just in living life, you know, with the, I mean, a lot of the younger generation probably may not have been able to see him play live or might not be smart enough to watch YouTube at this point. Um, but they remember his joyfulness from the commercials he's been in, you know, all the great things that he's done for the league and for the people around the world. And like you said, building the hospital is no short, no short feat. You know, that takes a lot of humbleness. That takes a lot of um, humility to be able to say, like, I want to go out there and help more people because I have the resources to do so. And not everybody does that. So it's definitely a sad day for him, for us, and of course, for his family um, and just wishing him the best because it, it's, it's definitely tough to have to do something like that. And as you guys said, um, definitely one of the cases where he left the world a better place uh, than when he found it. Um, and again, uh, Cardo, as you mentioned, uh, hopefully, that his family does find some type of solace in the fact that all the lives that the hospital was impacted and changed in the area in which, <laughs> again, getting a hospital built is crazy. Um, again, and that's not here. Um, in other countries, things that get put up quickly here, it might be a war to get things done in other places. Um, I'm sure some people don't really consider all that. Um, you know, when some people might be like, oh, they're rich, they got it done. You say, Cardo, it's, it's one thing to be like, oh, you're rich, get it done. It's another thing to actually follow it all the way through with all the red tape and all the issues you might face. Um, but again, just heck of an imprint, both uh, on and off the court, um, definitely going to be missing. I, I, again, I'm just so sick of the fact that we get to this, we, we do so many of these, and again, just so many people just feel like it's like, what the heck are y'all doing here with we're in the information age. Why does nobody know anything about anything? It's 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 Show ridiculous. Shoka era, man. It's a shoka era. No matter what right. they said, they just want everything handed to them. And especially like youngins here, how you don't know about uh, Matumbo and them and that Georgetown legacy, bro? Like that's a part of our basketball culture here in, in the DMV. Like. Georgetown, John Thompson, anything associated with that. If you come up playing basketball, uh, it's going to be a tie somehow to Georgetown. And if you don't know about that, that's just sad. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of a lot of the cats don't. All right. Uh, moving on to the NFC East. Octavia, the floor is yours. Uh, wild, wild times in that division once again, as always. <laughs> um. Yeah, I remember when I first – when I kind of first started talking about the home team, that I didn't really like that they were becoming competent. Uh, they're becoming a little uh, more competent, and it's starting to show. Um, so, of course, we'll start with the hometown Washington Commanders, your NFC East leaders. I don't know if we've ever said that in a long time, so definitely want to give them their flowers while we can. Um, the Washington Commanders uh, played against the Arizona Cardinals. They defeated the Cardinals 42-14. to um, Jaden Daniels was 26 of 30, 233 yards, zero sacks, eight carries for 47 yards. Ryan Robinson Jr. had 21 carries for 101 yards and one touchdown, three receptions for 12 yards. Alameda Zacchaeus, six receptions for 85 yards. And Terry McLaurin, seven receptions for 52 yards and one touchdown. Um, I mean, I, I've had so many, I was say great skins. I've had so many com commanders fans, you know, reaching out and you know i got a good friend i work with he was like we finally got a quarterback i was like just just stop talking to me bro like i don't want to talk about it <laughs> um but they do it seems like you know um coming out of the draft you know the big hoopla was about caleb williams and you know granted yes Jaden daniels had a lot of hoopla as well being the number two pick but everybody was really expecting caleb williams to to kind of go on the cj stroud trajectory that he had last year and it's really been Jaden daniels um, now he did throw his first interception of his young career, but one out of four games, can't really be too mad at it, especially when you beat a team 42 to 14. Um, and it wasn't 
an, it, it wasn't really like a bad decision. It was just a little bit of an errant throw. Um, that was pretty much his only error in the game. Um, he completed 26 of his 30 passes for 233 yards and a touchdown. He also, like I said, had the eight rushes of 47 yards, bringing his season total to 218 yards and a score. Um, I mean, the offense is clicking. Uh, I mean, I know probably the happiest person on that team is Terry McLaurin. Um, <laughs> you know, he's been out there left in a void for a while. We know the type of wide receiver he can be when if he had what they call a competent quarterback, and it looks like he has one. Um, I know he's had not that many targets in the first two games, but, you know, he's definitely loving where he is now. Um, you have even Zach Ertz, you know, still contributing to this, and this was a game where they didn't have Austin Eckler, who was out with a concussion, and Jeremy McNichols kind of stepped in and was still – able to continue with their running game. But, you know, the, the lead back being Brian Robinson Jr. for this game, who I probably say it every time, but I always knew he was better than Antonio Gibson because I don't know if you watch the Patriots, but uh, he out there struggling too. Um, but, yeah, I mean, even outside of that, I think a, th- a big thing to talk about also is that he hadn't he wasn't sacked in this game, and we know that their offensive line has been an issue for the last couple of years. So to have a clean game, you know, that's definitely something amazing to have under your belt for a uh, usually a, a struggling um, part of your offense. But, I mean, their offense has been so good. I think they said they punted one time in the last, like, three games. It's wild. I mean, their punter is just chilling. <laughs> and especially with the fact that they've also had uh, issues with kickers in the past. You know, you think about it, yeah, they're scoring a lot of touchdowns, but they're getting a lot of help from their kicker as well. Um, so they're kind of rolling. You know, granted – Still early in the season, you know, we don't really know where Arizona was, but we know Arizona had a pretty good defense and they were able to contain Kyler Murray. I think they say he only scrambled once for three yards, and that's so unexpected for Kyler Murray as we've seen him scurry out of a lot of situations in the backfield. Um, But their defense, you know, definitely came through as well. Um, The commanders had one of the worst statistical defenses heading into the game. Um, The Cardinals come into the game one and two. Um, and they boasted one of the league's best offenses, breaking seventh in yards and fourth in points per game. Um, but none of that happened in this game. <laughs> uh, the commanders uh, the commanders converted third downs with a conversion rate of forty five point five. Um, yeah, it, it was just it was really just a beatdown. Like I mean, it is what it is for the for the Cardinals. They probably just want to flush the game and forget it ever happened. Uh, congratulations to Cliff Kingsbury for the get back game. It's always, it's always a part of it. You know, you go back to where they said you couldn't get it done. And here I am. And I might have the quarterback that I thought I've always wanted. And we're we're rolling right now. So, you know, they have a lot to look forward to. Um, as time goes on, they will play against the Browns on Sunday, which we know the Browns are kind of hot and cold too, but their defense is usually pretty stout. Um, So that's also going to be a big test for them going forward. So looking forward to that game as well. Um, Next, we'll go to the interdivision game that we had on a Thursday night. We had the New York Giants versus the Dallas Cowboys on the New York Giants. Well, New York Giants versus Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys defeated the Giants 20 to 15. On the Giants side, Daniel Jones was 29 of 40, 281 yards, one interception. It was sacked once, four carries for three yards. Devin Singletary had 14 carries for 24 yards and one reception for 14 yards. And Malik Neighbors had 12 receptions, 115 yards, and one carry for a negative four yards. And on the other side, Dak Prescott was 22 of 27, 221 yards, two touchdowns, was sacked once, two carries for negative one yards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Enrico Dotto, 11 carries, 46 yards, and one reception for 15 yards and one touchdown. CD Lamb, seven receptions, 98 yards, and one touchdown. Um, I'll be honest, this game is kind of hard to watch, <laughs> but you know, uh, Dallas coming off of, of course, uh, uh, whatever you want to call the game against the Ravens last week. Um, granted, you know, it was blowout early for them. They were able to work their way back into that game, even though they still lost. Um, so, you know, anytime they play against an inner division, you know, game, it's always kind of up in the air. So hence to the fact that it was 20 to 15, um, which was surprising in the game is that there was really only one, two sacks, you know, one for each team. Um, now, probably not that surprising for the Cowboys because their offensive line is pretty good. But the New York Giants offensive line has always been a struggle as well. So to go against a, against 
a defense of Dallas's caliber, even though you can say they haven't been playing up to their standards. Um, it's definitely a win, I would say, in their <laughs> in their books. Uh, the Giants won the time of possession, 35 minutes and 37 seconds, 224 minutes and 23 seconds. Usually when you have a time of possession um, victory, it kind of, you know, kind of tilts the victory in your favor. It didn't happen. The Giants had four plays of over 10, had four drives of over 10 plays and came away with a field goal each time. Um, they are unable to get into the end zone, even with the likes of Malik Neighbors with 12, 12 receptions, 115 yards. Um in fact, they only got into the red zone twice in this game the entire night, just despite the dominant ball control. Um, so they definitely have some things I need to work on in order to – you have to be able to score in the red zone and you have to be able to get to the red zone more than that, especially with the fact that they don't really have a lot of down downfield threats. Um, of course, we know Malik Neighbors itself is a threat, um, but they were kind of banking on Jalen Hyatt being their downfield threat, and that really hasn't come to fruition. Um, Dallas came into the game supporting the worst defense in the NFL against the run, allowing just allowing 185.7 yards per game. The Giants have been rushing the football pretty decently for the first three weeks with Devin Singletary, um, but didn't happen in this game. The Cowboys tightened up their run defense um, and held the Giants to just 26 yards on 24 on 24 attempts, which is 1.1 yards per attempt. So run defense was kind of taken care of in that game. Uh, I mean, we talk about the Giants. It, it, I feel like they're still hit or miss. Devin Singletary is their lead back, and we know what he's done in the league. But, you know, that's the kind of defense and run defense that we expect from the Cowboys, but we expect that in even bigger games as well. Um, it's probably going to get a lot dif more difficult for them as well. They've suffered two huge injuries in this game. Um, DeMar Demarcus Lawrence has a list Frank injury, and I think they say he's out anywhere between four and eight weeks. And they said that bigger guys usually have a harder time with that because, of course, it's a lot of weight on your lower extremities. So they're definitely going to have to play that one by ear. And it looks like they're also preparing to play this Sunday without um, Michael Parsons, who has a high ankle sprain. That's going to be the one that's really going to be tough. Those high ankle sprains can be tricky. Um, it can it can heal fast or it cannot. You can be in a walking boot or you could be good. Um, so it's really, you know, hopefully he focuses a little bit more on his um, recovery than, you know, these podcasts with, my cornerback who was we suck so i don't know why they had time to do a, a podcast but here we are um so yeah i mean for the for the new york giants their next game is going to be against the seattle seahawks who played last night and even though they lost they're still proving that you know they're back i mean i don't you know we talk about the legion of doom a boom from past and we talk about you know the russell wilson uh years and the Pete Carroll, but Mike McDonald is, you know, really whipping them boys into shape and they look good, even though despite the loss they had last week. Um, on the other side for Dallas, um, their next game is going to be against the Steelers who usually are allergic to, I mean, they've been doing pretty well, even though this last game that they had against the Colts didn't go their way. Um, a couple of things also for the Cowboys, uh, I think it's Demarion Overshawn, um, second year standout linebacker. He's been everywhere. <laughs> I mean, He's been a bright spot for them on the defensive side, of course. I mean, he's he had eight tackles and a pass deflection. Um, he had a lot of open field tackling. Um, while he may be considered to be undersized, he's six foot two, 220 pounds. I mean, he's everywhere. So that's definitely a bright spot for their for their defense. And I'm sure they're hoping that that continues to tick up. Um, yeah, so I mean, their next game is going to be Sunday night. You know how I personally feel about primetime games, but that's that's on them with their primetime game Sunday night against the Steelers. Um, and without Micah, um, it, it should be interesting. Uh, I mean, granted, we know right now the Steelers defense, I mean, that defense offense isn't stellar. Um, it's better. Um, I think Justin Fields has been doing a good job back there um, for what he can do. I think they got to kind of really, <laughs> I mean, their weapons still have to really get going. Like I haven't heard enough about George Pickens. I haven't heard enough about Najee Harris. Uh, Jalen Warren was out the last game, so they definitely have a lot that they have to deal with as well. And last but not least, to the worst game of the week, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles played against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they got demolished again. If you did not know, 33-16. Uh, Jalen Hurst was 18 of 30, 158 yards, one touchdown, was sacked six times, eight carries for 20 yards, and one touchdown. Saquon Barkley had 10 carries for 84 yards, two receptions for 32 yards. 
Dallas Goddard, seven receptions, 62 yards. Paris Campbell, four receptions, 17 yards, and one touchdown. Um, to be honest, I'm not that upset. Uh, let's let's just keep it a buck. Whatever it is, the Buccaneers have our number. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. They Jalen does not do well against the top Bowls defense, and it shows uh, every time they play. Now, granted, this week was a lot more difficult without A.J. Brown, um, who's still nursing a hamstring injury, and then uh, Devontae Adams. Adams. <laughs> Devontae Smith did not play in this game as well, who did not clear concussion protocol. Um, Lane Johnson also did not play, who did not clear concussion protocol. Um, Cam Jorgens, the center, went out. Jalen Carter went out. They, obviously, they couldn't handle the heat as well. Um, but, I mean, it was just – it was lights out from the first – the first possession for the Buccaneers. Um, it, it was just I, Baker Mayfield looked like Tom Brady was still in Tampa Bay. To be fair, um, I mean we know Baker has had a pretty decent get, pretty decent year so far this year, um, but the Eagles and their starts have just been terrible. Like they, they 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 start the game. I think they said they're the only team in the NFL currently who has not scored a point in the first quarter um, of any game so far this year. Um, it's it's bad. Um, alongside of that, Jalen Hurts has 27 turnovers since the start of last season. Um, the most in the NFL for more than anyone else. Um, it, it's just bad. <laughs> it's like you really can't. I mean, granted, you know, I feel like I'm not that upset again because we, we were missing two of our top weapons. Um, all pro right tackle as well. Um, a lot of in and out. But the defense was just horrible um, after coming off of a, a game that they had last week. Um, against the New Orleans Saints where, I mean, they were explosive and they were able to hold them to 12 points. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're still just getting used to the Vic Vangio system or if they just suck. You know, some of them just suck. Let's be real. Um, and it, it just wasn't a good look. Going back to um, how they start the game, whew, it it's just – it's. It's been bad. Uh, the Eagles generated zero net yards and zero first downs on offense in the first six quarter uh, plays for the year so far uh, and dating back to last year. Uh, Tampa Bay put together 186 total net yards and, for, and 10 first downs, leading to 14 points. Uh, then the Eagles muffed the punt when Isaiah Rodgers, who also had to come in for, I think Darius Slay got hurt a little bit in the game as well. Um, but he was also in on the he was also in on special teams. He pushed the player into the into the returner and said he did it on purpose for whatever reason. Um, he thought that it would cause a flag for running into it. It was dumb. Um, let's be real with that. So sorry, it's a bug. Don't mind me, guys. Um, so it, it it's just bad all the way around. Um, and Cooper DeJean, who had to come in. Um, as a punt returner because Burton Covey, who is the normal punt returner, is out as well with a shoulder injury. So the bye week couldn't come fast enough. Um, luckily for them, the bye week is super early. So they'll be on a bye this week um, on week five, which, like I said, couldn't come better. Um, I've already heard a little bit of reports that A.J. Brown should be good afterwards. He looks like he'll be working his way back in. Um but yeah, it's just bad. The only bright spot you can really talk about is Saquon. You know, Saquon didn't have a great rushing day, um, but he was able to break one open that put them in a position in the third quarter to score a touchdown. Um, although we talk about special teams not doing that great, um, they Isaiah Rogers did block a punt that Keely Ringo um, recovered and ran down for a two-point conversion for them. So, I mean, they just got to go back to the drawing board. You know, they have a lot of penalties that they've been going through. They enter week four tied for 24th in red, red zone defense, 15th in third down percentages, 22nd in total defense, 24th in rush defense, 18th in pass defense, and tied for 25th in penalties per game, um, which all of that is at the back end of, of the league. Um, so, But what's crazy, I think I saw a report a couple of days ago that they're still the favorites to win the NFCs. I don't know how they are at this moment. Um, but, you know, with the amount of talent that they have on paper, it just needs to translate on to the field. And it's just not doing that right now. So, you know, to have tied for the fewest takeaways in the NFL, only team without scoring a point in the first half and the first quarter of a game, it's just not a good look. So they really got to go back to the drawing board. And then, of course, all the noise around Sirianni and Jalen Hurts and the relationship and, and whatever it is. I don't care what it is. I just needed to get together. 
<laughs> and get out there and put something on the field that is going to cost them, it's going to constitute them into winning the game. But luckily, I won't be this sad next week, even though I'm really not that sad. But luckily, I won't be sad next week because we can't lose on a bye, hopefully. Player podcasts say otherwise. Um, oh, uh, Ray. <laughs> You, you a Commanders fan now? What's going on, bro? It's <laughs> better, bro. It's special, bro. Oh, no. This, this, this is going to bring like that? God damn. This is, this is burnt orange. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn, man. Jerry, you stress me off. I understand. Not, not this subtle shift. <laughs> and also, before we move on to the WNBA playoffs, just. I think the nastiest podcast thing I've ever seen is Michael Parsons and Darius Slay together on a podcast as why as division rivals cooking one of, of Darius Slay's teammates. And then, and then you talk about your teammate and, and CJ Gardner Johnson, who we know talks too much. He's always talked too much. But then to get on the podcast with Michael Parsons, when Michael Parsons just did a podcast podcast episode maybe a week or two ago talking about cj gardner johnson and how because i think he said something about Derek a Derek car or whatever and then he talked about him and here you are on there with the ops like come on bro like it's, these y'all are different to practice these y'all is different I, he might different. need to focus on rehabbing his ankle it hit like the whole time he was sitting there he should have had his ankle elevated or something i don't know we're in goofy times octavia we got people in the Hall of Fame. They ain't do shit. Oh my god! Right, nah, nah. Go ahead, go ahead. My bad. My bad. Every division rivals on the podcast is nasty work. So is the other thing. On to the W playoffs, though. We're in the semifinals. Uh, the first round results in the sweeps all around. Um, that's how we're gonna recap the first round. Like it's, we talked a little bit about it last week. Brooms came out. Teams went home. We have advanced to the semis. It's it's no deeper than that. So. Uh, in quick succession, the Sun took care of the Fever, the Lynx dispatched the Mercury, the Liberty ended the Dream, the Aces advanced past the Storm. Now we're in the semis. Uh, game ones happened last Sunday. Well, this past Sunday, so a couple of days ago. Game twos are they're happening tonight as we're recording this week's episode. I think it's halftime of New York uh, Aces. And yeah, I can't wait to hear what y'all got to say about that series. Um, and then we got game two of Connecticut, Minnesota a little bit later. But uh, real quick, Sunday's matchup in the semis. Um, the Liberty beat the Aces 87 to 77. Uh, Stewie had 34 points on 12 and 19 from the floor. Uh, Sabrina Ionescu added 21. JJ had added a double double with 13 points and 12 rebounds for New York. The Aces were led by Plum's 24 points and Asia Wilson's 21. Cardell, we'll start with you. Your thoughts on the New York Liberty. Starting the semis up 1 0, knowing damn well they've been waiting since last year to get get back <laughs> on the Las Vegas Aces. Um, I'm not shocked. You know, I honestly picked the uh, Liberty to win it, just watching them throughout the season. They're on a mission. Um, listen, it's one thing to lose the championship, it's a totally different thing to lose it. <laughs> like on your home court, like you, you, you're right there, that that that's things. Um, and they and the credit to them, man. They got better. They got better, man. Uh, the we we can call a spade a spade. Their weakness last year was their backcourt, especially defensively. And that backcourt came back with a vengeance. Now Vandersloo is not the same player she was a few years ago. No disrespect, but she's figuring out a way to get stops. Like she's holding up. And Ionescu has finally became what she was drafted to be as far as every aspect of the game. She's hell. You got to deal with her. We already know what we're gonna get in the front court with uh, uh, John Quill, Stewie. You know, Kayla, uh, the six four Alana. Uh, not, not not Alana. Um, uh, the six four uh, forward. Uh, I always forget her name, man. Um, damn, she get the threes. Uh, hey, what is her name, man? She always she she she's underrated, man. Uh, give me a second, Fee bitch. Oh, Fee bitch. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, rookie. Rookie. yeah, the rookie score. She's six four. They they <laughs> they missed that part. She's six four, but she can guard 
two through four through two through five. So when her Stewart Jaw Quill on the string switching is hell. And that's the difference. They didn't have Feebish last year. She's not getting enough coverage and, and enough praise, probably outside of New York. I'm pretty sure New York they on it, but nationally they're not paying attention to her. Then you come on bench with, with, with you know with Kayla and Burke. And the thing I, I like the adjustment with the emergence of Feebish, you Vanderslew's coming off the bench. So she's going against their second string point guards. You know what I mean? And that she still have enough left in the tank to be able to make an impact that way instead of having to deal with Chelsea Gray. Um, and also, let's just keep it real, man. It's hard in the W to, to keep continuously repeat, man. It, it, it's tough. It's a grind. You know what I'm saying? And what you're seeing is uh, slowly but surely the Liberty are wearing them down, man. They are. Um, Asia, I love Asia, but her, Stewie, you, you can tell Stewie kind of taking it personal. <laughs> She getting all this MVP and being called the best in the game. So she's out to prove something. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, Alicia Clark is a defender. You know what I mean? But, you know, she's, what, 5'10", 5'11". Phoebe is 6'4". But can do what she do. That 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 matters. You know what I'm saying? So she's neutralizing her. Uh, Kelsey Plum, Jackie Young haven't really given you anything in the series, which is a testament to what we've been saying, you know what I'm saying? The, the backcourt holding up when, when Vanderslew comes to the game, when Kayla Thornton's in the game, INS school, um, they, they're going to work, man. Uh, luckily for them, Tiffany Hayes is giving them something off the bench. Otherwise, they would get absolutely nothing, you know, off the bench, man. And so if Asia is not Asia numbers-wise, man, I don't know. The brooms might be coming out, though. And I think that's what the Liberty's trying to do. Like, let's sweep this. And have y'all questioning that championship run last year? Like that's that's how we gonna get our leg back because the way they playing right now, it seems that's the case. And they play hard all year to get secure um, home court advantage when the Aces were up and down, man. Um, the low NBA program where we actually had to vote for it. You know what I mean? And you'd be surprised. I think like seventy five percent said the Aces. And I'm like, y'all ain't been paying attention enough. It, it don't look good. You know what I mean? It don't. And um, like age really has to. You know, I hate to say she got going like Cynthia Cooper type mode where it's just no doubt you're the best player in the world. Like no one's messing with you, like no undisputed for them to have a chance. But that's tough to do going up against Stewie and John Quill on that front court, man. So um, all I can say is good luck, man, because they on a mission, man. And when you run into one of them teams, you, you, we've seen it throughout WNBA and NBA history. When you run into one of them teams that's just super locked in, I don't care how much of a competitor you are, you can fight all you want. It's just like nothing works. And then you just finally realize, you know what? It's their time. We got to go back to the drawing board so we can get back our time. Because right now, it just looks like it's the Liberty's time, man. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the last point Cardell made, like, if Asia's not the best player on the floor, Vegas has no chance. And even if she is the best player on the floor, it's still an uphill battle because, yeah. like you said, man, the Liberty, they've been on one the entire season. And also they they kind of address the issues that cost them the championship last year. Uh, you got to give Sabrina her props. She's come back and she's, she's better in every aspect of the game, uh, most notably defensively. Like before, that was – they damn near played the Liberty backcourt off the floor the first two games of the finals last year, not the case this year. Um, and then on top of that, you got to deal with Stewie and John Quill. Um, yeah, game one, Stewie just, she remembered. <laughs> 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 she remembered, it, uh, you know, that three of 17 in the clinching game last year, it, it's been on her mind. And when you get a player of her ability locked in like that, it, it's it's a wrap. Um, but you know, Asia, she she's she's got to be the player she's been the entire season. Um, she can't she can't twenty one and five is not gonna cut it. Um, to be perfectly honest, like she she has to she's got to destroy them for for Vegas to be to 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 be competitive. And like that's that's another issue. Vegas didn't address any of their deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you can't come back with this. <laughs> The the game has changed, man. Like you, you can't come back with the same artillery when uh when uh when the opposition is upgraded. Like you're gonna be outgunned. And that's that's kind of what's happening. Um and 
and that's that's what they're looking at right now, man. It's it, right now they're you know they're fighting it down five, but uh, unless Asia goes Super Saiyan, the the Liberty's death and their and their overall talent is is just going to outweigh what the what Vegas has. Um, but in regards to Vegas, that's when you have an all universe player on your team. They got to be that, but I think honestly they relied too heavily on her being that um, on both ends of the floor uh, at the beginning of the season. Uh, their their defense was in disarray pretty much up and down the entire season. Asia cleaned a lot of that up offensively, especially when Chelsea was out. At times it's disjointed and they can't get anything. They can just get the ball to Asia. She do what she do, but when you got to deal with that that size and that length along with all world caliber players is it's tough man they they gotta figure something out um or it's not looking too good i tell you i mean yeah i mean you guys kind of said it all like it's kind of it's like some people probably are looking at the aces because of course they're two-time defending champions and of course everybody's looking for the three key but the Liberty, not really those people are looking for three feet. And you could tell that it's been on their mind since the game ended last year, um, even the way that it ended. Um, but yeah, they're over, they're outsized. You know, uh, John Paul is going to do <laughs> what she's doing down there. And it's crazy. Like, I, I've, we've seen them play before, but like, I don't know what it is with this game in game one. Like, John Paul looked like super bigger than Asia. Like, I know she's taller than her, but like, for some reason, it just looked like a huge difference and yet without them getting you know anything from well much from kelsey plum and others and chelsea gray with you know four points and one assist that's not going to get it done either um and on the other side like you said with anescu uh kind of really showing up and being who she was projected to be and then stewie she's basically kind of took Hopping back at a lot of people because you know last year when she won MVP a lot of people thought that she shouldn't have, so I'm sure she has a lot of get back on her mind too as well. Um, they're gonna have to clamp down pretty quickly, like you said, it's 57 52 currently. Um, and you don't want to go back to Las Vegas down 0 2. Um, it's coming out back at 0 2 deficit is gonna be tough, especially the way that it's. I mean, the first game looked pretty easy for the Liberty to be honest. Um, it looks like that they're giving a little bit more resistance in this game, but they're going to have to get together quick, fast, and in a hurry. And um, going against a determined team like the Liberty currently are, and then, like you said, with Phoebe stepping in, Courtney Vanners coming off the bench, um, and being and, and kind of thriving in the role, to be fair, um, it's going to be a tough battle for the Aces. I have hope for them because, of course, I would love to see a 3 P, you know, but it's always – kind of cool when you see a quote unquote upset because you got to remember the liberty of the number one seat it's not really going to be an upset hey man three peatings hard yeah <laughs> all the people who try to make it seem like it doesn't matter because of whatever you know their uh, local deity has said over the past years um because of narratives or whatever uh, three peating is it's why it's such it's why it means what it means, why it carries the weight that it does. Be it by injury or sheer, people aren't going to sit around and watch you win three times in a row. <laughs> like, <laughs> bro, like two times is a lot. Three times, somebody's going to get sick of it. And, Cardo, you point right, you mentioned it. Yours been mad since last year. And they've played like they've been mad since last year the entire regular season. Um, and I think one of the things that hurt the Aces, like you guys mentioned, uh, they never replaced Candace. Well, Candace was in that front court. Um, and they obviously replaced Hamby. Or or Hamby. Like their front court has been losing, lacking. Yeah, they've yeah. been losing vital pieces the yeah. last two years. Right now, they they playing with like four players, no disrespect. It's Plum, Young, Asia, and whatever Chelsea can give you as she's been getting healthier. Outside of that, you wishing. I mean, Tiffany Hayes balling, too. I give it to her. She She's showing up this season. But outside of that, you wishing. And, and that, that lack of depth now, you mentioned two very, like, huge players in, in you know, what, what Hamby and Candace meant to them. That's huge for their front court because that's extra work for Asia. We're talking about this matchup, right? 
Think about all the bodies she has to deal with in that front court, New York. Carter, I think you laid out some of it last week when you talked about their depth. Um, and again, you brought up Fevich. She's not even technically a big, but an extra 6'4 person crashed the class as an extra 6'4 body, man. Like, that's a lot. That, that's that's a lot why to you, deal with, man. Why you think Asia said, man, it's about the, uh, the Lemonade League? She's like, oh, no, I'm going to be chilling. And I was like, why would y'all even ask that question? I, I like, I would have been shocked if she played. I'm like, if I'm the team, oh no, you're not playing. You getting some rest. You going for three p, and you just want to go. And keep in mind, the Olympics was just a couple of years ago because of the COVID stuff. So she had that in the last two, two, three years as well. Oh no, you need to get some rest. She needs the rest, and then they need to go get her some help in that front court, because they, like you said, they are lacking severely and. Uh, like you guys mentioned, shout out to the New York guards for, you know, answering the bell. But uh, Liberty's front court got deeper, and like y'all said, uh, hey man, Stewie's going on every level. Some of the some of the dirt being thrown that way, like, hey man, shout out to y'all that got to talking too crazy, man. I don't know, but um, hey man, we're here. On to that other series though. We got Minnesota and Connecticut. I don't think Nafis and Kyle you missed a shot in the first round. Um, that's what it felt like. Uh, Connecticut didn't have time for that. They got them out the way 73 to 70. And we talked about it a couple weeks ago before the playoffs started. Connecticut's been one of the teams with so many bites at the apple. Like, that's another team similar to New York where it's, they've been right there. They've seen everything you want to see. They've done everything but win a title. Mm -hmm. uh, and Minnesota's Minnesota. We, we know what their uh, – I can't even think of the word. Like, just what their lineage is. Like, they're, 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 they're one of those story franchises – uh, you know, under Reed's direction and whatnot uh, in the W. But, uh, Ray, we'll start with you. Just, um, hey, man, what your thoughts on that series? Connecticut's up one of uh, Defensive masterclass. Uh, yeah, like you pointed out, Fee's not going to have the series she had against the Mercury. Um, and no disrespect to her because, obviously, she's she's been another one. Uh, between her, Asia, and Stewie, that's a they they just been tearing shit up this year, um, but yeah, it, it's not gonna be that easy against Connecticut. Um, is this is gonna be a gritty grittier series? Um, honestly, I think the X factor right now is is Mabry, uh, as she's been since she's joined the Sun. Uh, I don't know <laughs> why that trade was made. Um, <laughs> that's some. Uh, Kwame Brown for Paul Gasol type stuff going on, but um, but yeah, she man, she's been able to um to add something that Connecticut has been lacking. And that's being able to spray the floor and hit threes, um, and it gives them another dimension. Um, you know, it takes some pressure off uh, either DB or Alyssa Thomas. They don't have to be as explosive offensively because Mabry's making up for it, um, and they and they could just. You know do their thing on the defensive end as well um but they're still producing but you know if you if you have another um another outlet like that that's that you can just break glass in case of emergency advantage connecticut because um and somebody on minnesota is gonna have to match that uh because uh out, outside of fees uh, nobody really could get going in, in game one so uh yeah man i, I like what i like i like how connecticut's playing I like what they're doing um of course dj carrington She's continuing her stellar play. Um, it, it's Connecticut's another one of those teams, man. Their front court between um Bree Jones, Liz Thomas, and um and D B, that's a lot of size and length you gotta deal with. And um and they move. So uh yeah, they Minnesota's gonna have to figure figure it out. Um anxious to see what type of adjustments they made for um for game two. But um but yeah, man, if, if Marina Mabry keeps shooting the ball like she is. Then that's that's just another uh, another layer that Minnesota's gonna have to account for. And right now, I don't I don't think they can um, they can make up for that. Cardo. Yeah, I just think the size of the Sun got to him in Game One. He got to the Knicks in Game One. Uh, I don't think people understand how big, how much bigger they are, girth and height wise. Like for instance, you know, you see DeMar on the bottom, that's that's six four, six five. Um her match with Bridget Carlton, six one. You see what I'm saying? 
Bree Jones, 6'3, Alyssa Thomas, 6'2, but Alyssa Thomas, 6'2, but she's 203. That's like being, and on the man's side, that's like being 6'8, 6'9, but you're 250. But you're going against another wing that's 6'8, 6'9, but he's 220. You see what I'm saying? And that's why she was able to kind of have her way at 17, 10, and 9 on 8 or 12. And Fees struggled. Fees is 6'1, but she's 179. So Alyssa Thomas got about 20 plus pounds on her, and she's a, a little bit taller. Then you add in the length of Bonner and Bree Jones, it's tough down there. It's not, it's not going to be easy to get anything down there. Then you look on the perimeter, Courtney Williams, she she had an off night, 3 or 12. We know she can heat up, but it's tough. She's small. She's 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, She's going against DeJanae Carrington, who one of the top defenders in the league. She's 5'11", 6 feet, and can move with her. So she can defend Courtney still do what she do offensively. Courtney can't do nothing with her on defense. And those are the matchups that the Lynx gonna really have to try to figure out, um, because the the Sun exploited them enough to win. Now you have certain players step up. You know, I know maybe shot lights out, whatever. But uh, you know, Carl you still put up some decent numbers. But you know, Carlton stepped up. You know, what I'm saying you know hit some shots and whatnot. Uh, Kayla McBride was right there. She was solid, and he still almost pulled it out. But. What I think with the Sun, when they realize the matchups they they have in advantages, I think they're gonna really try to attack those matchups, and we're gonna see if the links hold up. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna see if they are able to to stop all that. If they're able to stop all that, then it's a different series. If not, it's gonna be tough for the links to, to win because they are at a disadvantage size and um, you know girth wise. Octavia, final thoughts on the series? Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. Is that the size matchup definitely played a part, and I mean. As great as Nafisa Collier has been being, I mean, she's defensive player of the year, um, as well as, I mean, I think that she said she averaged 40 points in the first round. Um, I would expect her to, you know, come out tonight really trying to, I don't want to say prove a point, you know, but come out firing on all cylinders. But the Sun have been knocking on the door, like you guys said, for the last couple of years, and it seems like they finally really got it all put together. Um, it's definitely going to be tough for the Lynx to bounce back in this if the Connecticut Sun keeps playing like that. And, I mean, we talk about Marina Mabry. Um, for a while during the season, I forgot that she was with Connecticut just because I'm so used to seeing her. Um, uh, I can't remember the other team. But, Chicago. Yeah. Um, so her being a, a, a spark for them, like, I mean, the three-point shooting that she's doing is crazy as well. So she's able to keep that up as well. It's definitely going to be a tough night for the Lynx, and, and the Lynx are going to need everybody to uh, to participate in helping them stop them. Um, but, yeah, I think the size difference uh, is definitely going to play a big part in it. But I expect Nafisa Collier to – I mean, granted, she showed up in this game and she had 19 points as well. Um, but I expect uh, for her to try to do a lot more in this game as well. But it's going to be a long series if they're not able to stop, you know, uh, Dewana who's – I mean, I don't know how many times she's been an all-star, and then you got Aly Alyssa as well, so it's going to be a tough series for them. Yeah, uh, like you guys mentioned, um, I'm anxious to see uh, what Reed's adjustments will be for game two. The other thing, keep it in mind, um, I think one of the things that the Fever did have in their favor in that first round was the pace they played at kind of kept Bree Jones off the floor a little bit in that first round series. In this series, that's not a case. You're getting, you're getting their full front line – all the time, like we saw a little bit more of uh, Olivia Nelson and Dota in that first round series, a bit for Connecticut. Um, so again, with Bree getting more time, that means Livia's coming off the bench like she normally is in those minutes. And again, back to size, Nelson and Dota six five six six with length and, and <laughs> high motor, whatever. Uh, yeah, I may just see the adjustments, we'll see how it goes. But um, look, man, two game two. So hopefully you guys check that out, and we'll be back next week. We'll have an idea next week who's going to be playing for the WNBA finals. That's that's the good news there. Uh, and obviously, if we're getting to the finals in the W, means on the men's side of things, the season's pretty much here. Like we're we're here. Um, Cardell, I know you checked out Media Day, got some stuff up. We're we're revamping the channel, so we'll have that out to you guys over you know the next 48 hours or what have you. Um, so just keep checking, checking back. But uh Cardell, your takeaways from media day. Accountability is thrown around a lot especially by the newcomers, the new vets. Uh, one thing I noticed that was spoken about from Brogdon, Valachunas, Coos, uh, 
we're gonna cut all that quitting when we get down out. That's what they 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 specifically said that team going to 10 on run or we down at halftime, down in the third quarter, we keep fighting until the game is over. Uh we not about to quit, not this year, not, not with us on the team. And I like that tone because yeah, it was a lot of games. The Wizards get down, we knew the game was over. They didn't even try to fight back. Um, I, I like I like the head new head coach's approach. Um and, and, and you know he he's kind of one of those guys gonna tell you like it is, and if you don't like it, eh, I mean you'll get over it. You know you make a lot of money, go see a psychiatrist, get over it. It's about winning games, you know. And the thing I like about the new vets that they brought in, they're professional. One thing Brogdon Valanciunas said, like I like them already because I want to be coached. So uh, Valanciunas said, yeah, if I'm messing up, yell at me. I want to be coached, you know. And they asking him about how he gonna groom the young big man. Saw and all those guys, he said, one thing I'm going to do is lead by example, and I'm going to show them through my actions. But I'm not a coach. It's not my job to coach. It's, it's the coach's job to coach. You see what I'm saying? So um, with my actions, they should be able to catch on. I give them some game on my experiences throughout the league, but it's up to the coaches to get them ready, and they and they have to be willing to work. And so far, so good. He said they're, they're working. Uh, so I love the fact that accountability was thrown out there. Also, the versatility is a lot of players that can get the ball off the board and bring it up and make something happen. Uh, Keep then expound on the exact players. Uh, you, you know, you could look at the roster and kind of get an idea, but there's a number of players that can cause mismatches all game because they get their, their ability to rebound, bring the ball up, and make plays. And that's something they really didn't have. Last year it was either who second half, uh, I don't say the first half, the second half of the season, uh, Kuz, um, or well, Tyus Jones, for the most part, to be honest, that was it. You know, everybody else had to kind of rely on them, and it made it kind of easy. Now it's going to be tough. It's, it's going to be tough for guys to key in on certain guys, man. So uh, I like that. I like that Bilal Kulabali grew, you know, 6'6 six, six to 6'9 six, over the summer. You know what I mean? Like, as soon as he walked in, you could just hear everybody like, whoa, whoa, what the f-? Yeah, You could just tell. So, you know, somebody just threw it out of you like, yeah, I'm, you know, 6'9 now. So that always helps, you know. Uh, never hurts to grow a little bit, and um, you know, you 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 got a team that understands where they are, but at the same time, they not. It's not like the helpless feeling, like man, we're gonna be back in the lottery. And it's like, all right, I expect us to win some games. Do I expect this to win 50, 60 games? No, we don't. We we don't have the talent for that. We're very young, but I expect us to be competitive, and, and um, kind of be there at the end. When I mean be there at the end, play all play in battling for a play-in spot or whatnot. Like, you know, if you look at the roster right now, if they're healthy and, and they jail, uh, 30 to 40 wins is not unreasonable for this for this team. You see what I'm saying? If, and if you get that and you're fighting for a play-in spot, it damn sure better be better than what we got last year. Uh, that's for damn sure. Um, that, that, it was tough. <laughs> it was tough going to some games, man. But, you know, it, it's, just, it's just that, man. You know, and the main thing I like that they, they all work. Everybody's talking about how everybody's been working, even throughout the summer. You know, Poole, he's more comfortable. He organized team events throughout the summer. The whole team, where especially after the draft, where everybody went out to L.A. and Miami, play. Uh, Jonas just came. Uh, he only been there a week, so you know, trying to get acclimated, get his family straight. Uh, you know, to the D.C. area, but you know, outside of that, everybody's just been in L.A. working. So we're gonna see very soon. Uh, I think this one week, this is the only week of training camp that we hit preseason. I'm here to help then, then it's go time. So we're going to see what it is very quickly. All right, I'm going to play a couple minutes from uh, Kuzma's media availability, and we come back. Cardell, if you got anything for rapid fire, we'll get to that. Okay. So listen to Kyle Kuzma on media there. Um, you know, I think um, I've had back to back career years. I don't think I. I don't, I don't see that not happening again this year. And I think uh, last year I had a career year passing the ball. And I think that is my uh, biggest emphasis because I can affect the game in multiple ways. And uh, I want to make people better. So. Kyle, super early to say this is the best group that you've been around, at least in Washington, in terms of chemistry and camaraderie. This is only September. But at which point? part of the offseason did that become clear to you, whether it was in Miami or in uh, California, but which part of the offseason was like, yeah, this is uh, this is going to be good? Just a feeling. Um, I'm, I think I'm 
I've been gifted by God, you know, just, uh, you know, I can read vibes, I can read the room, I can, um, you know, fill out people just from a vibration standpoint. And I think that one, we've been together since June, because we had Miami, we had Vegas, we had a longer stint in August uh, in Southern California. And um, I just like the vibe that we have. I think everybody gets along, partly also because everybody's like the same age. Um, I'm 29, but I'm, I'm a little bit younger than the average 29 year old. So um, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Goose, what did you think um, changed with Jordan after the All Star break in terms of him unlocking more of his himself? Uh, truly, I, I, no clue, honestly. Um, I think he just, um, you know, figured it out on his own. But I can't say. Um, from last year to over the summer and to now, I think Jordan is a much diff- different person. Um, I think he's more relaxed. I think he's more at home. I think for him coming to a new situation uh, off the first time of his career was probably really, really hard and a little bit different. And everybody moves and develops at a different pace. So, you know, you got to give people grace in, in, in this world. So um, I love where he's at from a mentality standpoint i think that um he's jordan Poole. you know i don't think last year he necessarily was he was a little bit quiet a little bit standoffish a little bit and i mean we have the same agency and i, I know for a fact the conversation that was not him and i think that i see more of what jordan Poole is now so um, brandon with pgc right how you feel about him I know you mentioned being 29 years old and the lifespan that you've lived. Uh, what are some keys you can take away and share with some young people to get to where you are right now? Um, yeah, be yourself, um, be unapologetic. Um, you know, I think I'm at a place in my life right now where I'm really at peace because, um, you know, I, I try to live my life on my own accord and, um, you know, I'm not really trying to do things for the attention of others and, um, the opinions of others. And I think that um, if you do things wholeheartedly and you do things with passion, love, uh, things will vote out for you. So, yeah. Kyle, you talked about your career year last year, but how do you square having a career year individually and then the team not having the success? And when you have moments where you can think about reflection of that, where can you improve upon still having a career year, but helping this team kind of take that next step? Um, things you can't control, you can't control uh, everything, you know, you can have a great game and still lose, right? You can play a great team game and still lose by one at the buzzer. Can't control it, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I feel like it's like one coming in every single day, doing what you need to do, um, being an example for everybody, seeing that tone and, um, letting the chips fall where they may, because, um, unpredictable. How you doing, All right, Cardell, uh, what you got for us for rapid fire? Yeah, a couple quick questions. Well, things going on in sports. On, I'm going to start on the NFL side. Uh, Devontae Adams, man, apparently is uh, once his, once his way out of Vegas, man. Uh, NFL Network's Ian Rappaport and Mike Garofalo for the Tuesday citing sources that Adams was a, has informed the Raiders that he prefers to be traded. Uh, Chef also reported that the Raiders are open to trading Adams and are looking for a package that includes a second round pick and additional compensation. Uh, Adams 31 is in the middle of his third season with the Raiders since arriving via trade from the Green Bay Packers in March 2022. He has three years remaining on his contract and is set to make $35.6 million in both 2025 and 26. Uh, the six-time Pro Bowler receiver and three-time All-Pro saw the Raiders as an intriguing destination back in 2022 in part because his college teammate Derek Carr was still franchise quarterback with Carr now in New Orleans and the Raiders having plenty of uncertainty on the center between Garner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell Adams looking for a way out in three games this season Adams has caught 18 passes for 209 yards and one touchdown as the Raiders have opened the 24 campaign with a two and two record Octavia uh, what are your thoughts on Mr. Adams running out I mean, he could have said this like a couple months ago when he was asked, you know, you, you know, he tried to die on that hill 
Like, ah, man, I'm not requesting no. I'm here for life. Like, come on, bro. We knew. We knew. When you had to dis- when they had to decide between Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell as your quarterback, like let's 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 keep it a buck. And we all know that all the rumors are going to be swirling now that he's going to try to find his way over to New York and wear some green. Um, that'll be interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm here for you know the sweepstakes of where he ends up. I love. I mean, I don't love it. I hope he stays. In the AFC, I like when good people stay out of the NFC and don't come in the NFC East. We got enough going on. Um, but yeah, I, I would be interested to see who lands him. You know, there are some teams that currently probably could really use him. I don't know if they would need him long term, just based off of some of the young talent that they have, but they have a lot of injuries, Kansas City. Um, but yeah, I mean. Like as as much as we know him and Aaron Rodgers want to play together again, I mean the Jets not looking too hot <laughs> to be fair. Um, but I understand that sometimes you know comfort is, is really what you're looking for. I mean, and I'm sure he's very comfortable with Aaron Rodgers. Um, but I mean Garrett Wilson is supposed to be Aaron Rodgers' new Devonte Adams. I don't know how well that's working out. Um, it looks like uh, Alan Lazard is actually Devontae, uh, Aaron Rodgers' new Devontae Adams in New York. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to see who really put their hand in the sweepstakes. Uh, second round pick for Devontae Adams is nasty. Um, it, uh, it's nasty to think like I saw you, <laughs> but hey, I mean, I get it with the, the type of contract that he has. I'm sure that whoever does sign him is probably going to be looking to reconstruct that, that um, contract as well. Um, but it's no surprise here. I'm just, I'm just surprised it took him this long to admit it. Uh, honestly, he's been saying this since he was on that damn receivers dog. He said it throughout that whole shit, but you know, that's just that, and that's what I'm saying. But then when the season gets ready to start and we in training camp, he, he backpedals. And I think I read where they said that like he was caught on the silence and like, I gotta get the F out of here. I've never been hurt. I've never been hit so much in my life. I'm going to lose my life out here. And it's like, you know. And that's why I get – obviously, I'm good either way because he can yeah, make the Raiders worse. makes my, my Broncos – things easier for my Broncos. But he whines too much for me, man. If you a dog, man, go out there and do your job. You know, go out there and do something. Help your team win. You see what I'm saying? Do the best you can with what you got, bro. You know what I'm saying? I get it. You had, you had your chances. You had your chances. But even last year with Jimmy G, bro, he – no. I think he's used to like princess treatment because he's been with Aaron for so long, so he didn't exactly. really have to do too much. And I, I honestly think that he probably thought he was better off. I won't say he thought he was better off without Aaron, but I think he saw the opportunity to play with Derek Carr and was just like, it's got to be better than what I'm doing now because I'm not doing anything. And I think he finally realized that, yeah, I probably made a terrible decision by doing this because number one, Derek Carr is no longer here. Um, I mean, who knows? Maybe he finds his way down to New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, Chris Olave is still out there, and I think he's a little banged up. Um, but Rasheed Rice is really coming on as well, but it's not too much after them, so I, who knows? Yeah, these diva rock wide receivers are crazy. They call it the diva position for a reason, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ain't the only one reminiscing a certain wide receiver in Miami going through something similar. But, uh, Ray, <laughs> uh, your thoughts? <laughs> I think they just said they uh they just opened up uh, Odell Beckham's window too, like he set for his first practice. I'm like, well, that's I guess that's something. Who's throwing him the ball? <laughs> like, come on, guys. And he's kind of wanting to. Yeah, that's that's like the equivalent of Ben Simmons, bro. That is a great analogy, actually. <laughs> that is an amazing analogy. Yeah, I'm not even talking trash because at least when Odell's help, he he balls. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that, but. It's always an injury where they can't ball the last few years. It's the same thing. So I don't want to hear it today on the field, on the court, doing something. That's when we had acknowledged their existence. It's just it's it what it is, what it is. Go ahead, right? Yeah. Um, like I tell you, said like this could have been resolved in the summertime. And um, th- see, this is why I wouldn't last as an owner because my patience is thin. As soon as I get a, a inkling that you don't want to be here, I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not wasting time. Yeah. Like, what are we doing here? It's supper time. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, come on, bro. Like, and then him in 
like like Octavia said, man, why are you shoveling out that PC garbage? We know you don't want to be there. <laughs> like, what do you? <laughs> nobody cares about this flimsy flute fake answer. Like, but yeah, like, I, <laughs> yeah, man, it, it, this wouldn't be an issue right now. I'm making a decision. That's that's all I'm gonna leave it at. Wilson. Hey man, it's it's ridiculous because you could have had you could have had BA. You knew you didn't want to be there. Like AP is BA's college coach. They had that thing ready to go. No. Again, go Cardell, you mentioned a wide receiver show. You knew <clears throat> going into that draft, you knew the situ the status of the quarterback position on your team, sir. You shouldn't have left. We shouldn't have left the month of the draft with you still being a Raider. But now I see why you and Aaron vibe together so much. Y'all both think everybody else is stupid. Y'all don't have to do PC stuff. Just go. If you want to go, go. You should have stayed your butt in Green Bay and shout out to Green Bay for doing what they did. It was like, hey, brother, you don't want to be here? Bye. And they went and just drafted wide receivers. They don't even know if they hit on them. They got a room full of dudes who don't make nothing. But you know what they don't give them? Headaches. You know what they don't do? Not run Matt LaFleur's offense. You know what you're doing? About to get on AP's last nerve. And I saw, you know how bad you, you know how bad you gotta be. And you can tell AP's from the old school in terms of Antonio Pierce. They, they call AP like in a post about Devontae talking about he wanted to get out of there. They don't want you around, dude. No. Like you got folks like. If Max Crosby and that defense is willing to come to work every day, regardless of their quarterback situation, sir, you could have just left. You just could have left. Also, if I'm the Raiders, man, look, I don't care what they talk about with that second round pick. It starts at Garrett Wilson. It starts right at Garrett Wilson. Because Garrett Wilson's already sick of Aaron. <laughs> Garrett Wilson doesn't have Devontae's time and patience. We didn't grow together. Bro, you're tripping. I'm watching all my friends. Run these offenses. They're having a blast, sir. I know Chris Alave is on the phone like, dog, you see what we running? Oh, uh, man, you know, we, we got to wait to see what Aaron's tells do to relay in and then look for the hand signal for the – that doesn't – what are we doing here? It starts at Garrett Wilson like – it's oh, all right. Yeah. I mean, Wilson, 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 is that Aaron Rodgers or is that Nathaniel Hackett or both? Oh, dog, uh, heck, it works for Rodgers. So, I mean, you know, hey, man, <laughs> that's where everybody got it messed up. Dude left Green Bay. Look, Aaron's a special dude, right? The flirt runs, you know who's offense. He's from that evasion and tree, whatever. The offense works. The flirt gets the Green Bay. Dude wins the MVP after being dead for quite a while in the offense. Then he gets the beefing because the is like, hey, dude, we losing to my, my guy because you won't run the offense. That's why they kept using, losing to the Jimmy G Niners. Not because the Niners were better than because dude doesn't want to run the offense. I just want to throw to Vontae and Alan Lazar. Right, run the offense, it works. What, what, what you doing? Now you got Hackett over there, over there, wasting Garrett Wilson's life. If I'm the Raiders, give me Garrett Wilson. If I could get Garrett Wilson and Sauce out of there, I want, I want to find out how much power Aaron Rodgers has on the Jets. If I'm the Raiders, I'm here to cause all the disarray in the world. Give me two of the young things you prize the most. You can have, you can have this friend. Here you go. I don't even want the picks. Just give me give me your two best young players, man. But like you guys said, we shouldn't even be here right now. You could have left after the Netflix crew finished filming. <laughs> I, that's Real. crazy, man. Diva wide receiver. They call it the, the diva position for a reason, man. Our last question, then we're going to get up out of here. Uh, the Knicks, man, have found a new star. Uh, uh the Knicks and the Timberwolves have finalized an agreement to trade Carl Anthony Towns to the Knicks. Uh, New York will send a package headline by Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo, back to Minnesota in the deal. Uh, the Knicks will also send the Timberwolves a first-round pick from Detroit. Uh, the Knicks will also send Daquan Jeffries and draft compensation to the Charlotte Hornets in order to clear salary for Towns' arrival. Uh, the trade has sizing ramifications for two teams with championship aspirations this upcoming season. Towns, a four-time All-Star, who has spent all of his nine seasons in the NBA in Minnesota, gives a, a defensive mind in the Knicks team and elite scorer and shooter. Uh, last season, he averaged 21.8 points and 8.3 rebounds, uh, shooting 
41.6% from the behind the arc. Uh, Towns will also join Jalen Brunson, fellow offseason addition with Kyle Bridges and the Big Alpha. Uh, former unit that appears more than capable of replicating the, su the success of the last two years. Uh, the Knicks have made the Eastern Conference semifinals in each of the last two campaigns, but have been unable to get over the hump and into the conference final. Right on all of this past season, sports to replace Towns and also Rudy Gobert and the Timber was front court. Though he only played 46 games due to injury, he averaged 24 points, 9 points, three rebounds, and five assists when active. Uh, DiVincenzo likely stands to play a small, a similar role to the one he filled in New York. Uh, the 27-year-old was coming off a career year in which he averaged 15.5 points per game while shooting 40% from three, both career highs. Uh, Ray, we're going to start with you. What are your thoughts on the trade, man? Uh, and uh, what do you think came out on top? And what do you think it means for both teams as far as getting to the next point? Minnesota obviously getting to the finals and New York trying to get to the conference finals and beyond. Oh man, it feels like a lateral move to me. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I do like Minnesota getting um, Divincenzo. That's that's a big pickup. Uh, you know what he brings. Um, you know that's we got. We, they gave Ant um, a running mate in the backcourt, but um, yeah, uh, I saw a tweet the other day. It was probably the best advice anybody could ever give cat hire somebody to manage your social media don't even <laughs> don't even go there um <laughs> yeah uh because it, it, it's about to be hell bro <laughs> unless you go out and you and you produce at the highest level new york don't play man um so don't even don't even dip your toe in that keep keep your head in the book or something uh focus on basketball don't leave the house door dash uber eats all that because um yeah that that's that's a different beast right there um as far as randall going to minnesota he's gonna have to i'm sure he understands that he's in the passenger seat now um that's ant's team <laughs> i think that's pretty obvious uh if he can if he can uh find a way to fit in with that then I mean, yeah, that, that it could it could be positive for them because he's obviously very good, but um, but yeah, man, it it, it neither it it doesn't move the needle either way for me to be to just from the outside looking in at this point. Um, be interesting to see how that plays out through the course of the season, but uh, but yeah, I, I just feel like both franchises saw an opportunity to get to get rid of players they felt were expendable at this point and move in a new direction. Uh, I think Nas Reed's ascension um, made it possible to move Cat with that contract um, because they feel like, you know, he's talented enough to kind of um, not completely fill the void, but he he can um, he can produce and uh, and still help them, um, you know, try to get to that next level. So, um, so yeah, man, I'll, I'll just be watching with interest and, uh, you know, we'll see. I'll save you. Yeah, I agree. I think it kind of just gives a fresh start to both players. Like, we know Julius Randle probably was going to feel some type of left out off of not being really a part of the resurgence of the Knicks towards the latter part of the season last year. And I'm sure that there were question marks behind uh, how he would fit into what they had already going on. Um, I will say I'm very sad to not see all of the Villanova boys play together. I thought that would have been kind of cool. That's just a weird you know, thing that I thought would have been cool. But understandable, it seems like Dante DiVincenzo uh, was worried about his role um, with Mikel coming in, of course, and him coming off of a pretty good year as well. So I think that gives him an opportunity to try to go carve out a place for himself in Minnesota. And Ray, I 100% agree. Uh, Carl, uh, Carl Anthony Thomas should – Cat should not look at Twitter at all. Um, it's, it's going to be terrible, especially because he already has a persona or a, a reputation or people will call him, quote unquote, soft. Um, so it, we, he doesn't want to amplify that any more than it probably is already. Um, but I think it'll be interesting. You know, I, I kind of agree. I'm not too sure how it's going to affect either or. Um, I think it does give them some more leverage after losing Isaiah Hartenstein. 
Um, and then not really knowing how Julius Randle will come back off of the injury. And then, I mean, you know, in the East, every this everybody's really trying to, they got to gear up to kind of go what's going on in, in Boston. So you see a lot of people getting pieces together to try to compete with that as well. Um, so I think that they probably think that that will help him, you know, him playing against Chris Stapps um, and, and him, you know, him playing against Joel and, and things of that sort out there in the East. Um, and then the last thing I like about it is I get to see Jordan in New York. I think she'll love it. Uh, Rosa. <laughs> hey, the Timberwolves just say so much money. It's not, it's just not funny, man. Um, you know, the, the what was it called? I think like the last couple of years have been talking about the apron now um, and how that affects teams and how they operate kind of, uh, well-run organizations just having the foresight, the similar to the NFL type well-run organizations where you kind of look five years in advance to see, yeah, the cap might go up and that's great. However, uh, the percentage of somebody taking up the cap and the cap hit matters almost a little bit even more now when we start talking about those aprons. So for example, cat just signed that four year deal, right? Dude, <laughs> the, uh, the, the lowest he's getting paid, Cap hit wise, uh, in terms of the lowest he's getting hit, uh, he's hitting the cap hit is this year at 49 mil. Then it goes 53, 57, 61. It does the same thing for the apron salary, right? If if you're in Minnesota, as you continue, you know, answer your guy, right? We know that you want to continue building, you know, what you add in the draft, what have you. Uh, to get off that contract is crazy because Cat's deal is only going to take up more and more space. So one from a roster standpoint, a lot of flexibility. And Julius Randle is looking for a contract extension that New York has not given him. He's technically on an expiring deal uh, with the player option. So for Julius Randle, it's kind of a thing for him. It's kind of like, a sir, this is a hell of a, uh, an audition for you to see if you can stay in Minnesota going forward and for the rest of the teams around the league. Because, again, that follow next year, not this year, is a player option. They don't have, you don't have to make it through the year in Minnesota um, just to keep that in mind. Uh, but, again, I get it from Minnesota sides because some teams you have to start thinking like that uh, because they made it harder because, if you know, the, those really smart fellas in charge of the Players Association, what have you, uh, with the whole no super team crap. And now uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be tougher to build teams a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I just give Minnesota credit for foresight uh, from that. Part of it, I know everyone's stuck with, like, obviously from a purely basketball standpoint, um, this is kind of the luxury you have or that they have and what they've developed with Nas Reed. Um, yeah, Nas is not cat, but Nas is a big piece of what Minnesota does and a luxury that they had. So you go from your somebody who was a luxury to, hey, can you do a little bit more? I don't think that's, you know, he doesn't have to replace cat. It's just can you take a bigger role. If Julius Randle, you know, shows that he fits what the Timberwolves – you know, fits into their culture and what they're trying to build. You know, that's that's a bridge you cross when you get there. But um, I'm kind of leaning towards Minnesota a little bit because I'm just focused on that financial part of it because, like, that's huge. Also, like you guys said, Dante coming off that bench is great. We know what they added in the draft with Dillingham uh, and the other young fella. Um, another proven vet off the bench definitely helps. Uh, and for, for New York, I get it. Like, I understand it. Like, Mitchell Robinson hasn't been in the lineup, like, consistently. Bigs haven't been healthy consistently in uh, New York. But, um, yeah, Cat needs to stay off. Just burn your phone, man. Just message by Telegram, smoke signal, whatever. Like, it's going to be tough out there. Yeah, I'm going to be brief. Um, I actually like to move for the Knicks. Um, you need somebody that can – that can, that Embiid and Porzingis have to guard. Simple as that. Bam, bam, too. Um, if you're trying to get out the East, you have you, you got to do that. Uh even the uh, Twin Towers out in Cleveland, you look at the paces, they came up as well. You need a big where I have to guard you. And you got a guard cat now, and it's going to be lethal. Let's call it what it is. That Jalen Brunson pick and roll with cat, and you got Mikel Bridges and Josh Hart and them boys spotting up. Uh, you, your defense better be on point. It, it, can, get, it can get bad quick. Um, so I, I like the fit right away. Um, it's just that, well, you know, cat. He has to buy in defensively to how they get down defensively. That's the that's the other side of it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can't cook. You can't have 21, whatever, 21 to 9, but you're giving up 30 to Embiid and, and, and Pozingas and stuff like that, man. You know, and Bam and all those guys. Uh, the other thing, 
he ain't tripping off New York, you know, cats from New Jersey, you know how it is. So he ain't bugging off that. And as for Minnesota side of it, uh, fifth, I plead the fifth. I'm leave that alone. Not shocked at all. We appreciate you guys tuning in this week. I will check in with y'all next week, which, look, hopefully we're preview, previewing the WNBA Finals, amongst other things. Also, we will have had some NBA preseason by that time as well. Again, don't forget to get over to the FocusTV.com and over the next couple of days, um, if you guys already have the Focus, uh, the Focus Roku channel, just go ahead and update that thing. If you don't have it, you know, by like Friday or something, go ahead and add it. Uh, we'll let you guys know on social media when the revamp channel is up and going. But again, thank you guys. We'll see you guys next week.